hey, it's me, Gar. Miss Podfic is recommended for those over the age of 13. Thank you. Anyways. It's a sweet, sweet thing. By Max Dramatic Shenanigans. Read by Mika. One. Remus has always found summertime to be bittersweet. He feels a great sense of accomplishment to have made it through another year, especially as the coursework continues to get tougher and tougher. But he always misses Hogwarts like a lost limb, and after ten months of living out of each other's back pockets, it feels weird to be parting ways with his friends. This summer, however, Remus is spending at the Potters. He's only been to James's house twice, once for Christmas holiday in fifth year, and then for a week the following summer. But this time, Remus is spending the entire summer there, and he can't remember the last time he was this excited. Two whole months of no homework, trips into Muggle London, and Euphemia Potter's marvellous cooking. It's going to be brilliant. Not to mention, the Potters had taken Sirius in sixth year, and Peter's house is just up the road, which means both of them will be there too. There will be no separating the Marauders this year. It'll be a riot, for sure. That, perhaps, is what Remus is most excited for. Spending the whole summer with all of his friends. Although, he's especially looking forward to more time with Sirius. Getting letters in his sprawling script is nice and all, but nothing beats Sirius sneaking into his four-poster to share some chocolate and whisper all through the night. James, to no one's surprise, convinces them all to come out to the makeshift Quidditch pitch in the backyard, to run through some drills and scrimmage each other, two on two. He's done it every single day since they arrived at his house, and each time, he's been met with the same level of excitement and agreeability. Sirius races him to their brooms, Peter hot on their heels, and even Remus finds himself looking forward to mounting his broom for an afternoon of fun and games in the sun. Perhaps it's because it's only the second week of summer, and the boys are still enamoured with the prospect of no classes and getting to do whatever they want with their free time, but no one has complained yet or is tired of the constant Quidditch. Not even Sirius, who grows bored of the monotony rather quickly, and is very vocal about it when he does. That being said, Remus is sure that by the end of the month, or maybe even next week, at least one of them will start to groan and grumble when James suggests it. And really, it's only a matter of whether he'll break first or Sirius and he's even more sure that it'll probably be himself. Remus has never been as enthusiastic about Quidditch as the rest of his friends. That might have to do with the fact that he doesn't like to fly. He can do it just fine, knows how to mount a broom and take off into the sky without a problem, but he'll take walking over catapulting through the sky on a wobbly stick any day. He can admit, though, that he's learned to hate it a little less, thanks to James and Sirius. As a self-identified Quidditch enthusiast of the highest degree, James made it his personal mission to indoctrinate all of his friends into his fanaticism, or at the very least, ensure they all liked it enough to follow along when he went on one of his rants, or to join in on a game if he begged enough. Peter, having grown up with James, was already a very dedicated Quidditch fan. He always tagged along when James wanted someone to join him on the pitch to practice his agility, or get in some more speed training, and rarely ever complained about it. At least, not to James's face. Peter also could always be found in the stands on match day. Gryffindor colours bright on his cheeks, and his maroon and gold scarf wrapped thrice around his neck. 
He knew the team stats at the drop of a hat, and if he'd just a bit more skill and was a little bit faster, he could have made a great addition to the team. Sirius, too, loved the sport. He wasn't as wild about it as James was. Then again, nobody was, and he wasn't as obsessive as Peter, but he loved flying, and he loved the competitiveness of it, and the glory that came with winning. He was one half of the best beaters the Gryffindor team had ever seen. He and Marlene McKinnon made quite the pair, and he was bloody proud of it. If there was one thing he didn't like, it would be waking up before the sun to train. That never happened without lots of grumbling, and cursing James's good name for being the most ruthless, dedicated captain. Remus, though, Remus had no interest in trying out for the Gryffindor team, no matter how much James pestered him about it. He didn't have a favourite professional team either, and only knew the names of some of those teams and their players because of James and Peter and Sirius. He did go to the house matches with Peter and Mary and Lily when he could, though, and even let Peter draw the maroon and gold war paint on his cheeks once or twice. He may have even started letting Peter do it more, and getting more creative, too, after the one time Sirius poked him in the cheek and teased him about it, calling his house pride cute. And house pride was nice and all, but and he wouldn't tell this to anybody in the world. The real reason he liked going to the matches was because of Sirius. Watching him play Quidditch was truly something else. He was as quick as a whip, and he had this fluid, graceful sort of control over his broom that was completely unique to him. Not even James was that good on his broom, and Sirius had some sort of wicked sixth sense about where the bludgers were too always spotting them coming before anyone else. It had saved the Gryffindor players more times than they could count. Okay, so maybe Sirius plays more of a role in Remus's enjoyment of Quidditch than he thought. But it probably comes down to the fact that Remus would do just about anything for his friends. That he finds himself indulging James with bright eyes and an eager yes every time he drags them outside this summer. There's just something about the four of them messing about in the sunny backyard of Potter's house that makes Remus like Quidditch so much more. James takes it seriously, of course, but not in the same way as he does when they're on the pitch at Hogwarts, even if it is just for fun. There are no pending matches to prepare for, no underlying need to perfect anything, nothing to work towards proving to anyone. It's just four zealous boys, throwing quaffles and chasing snitches and smacking bludgers so hard they knock off whole branches off the trees, when they go careening into them. Those hours in the sky are full of racious laughter, increasingly daring and ridiculous manoeuvres and friendly competition. And maybe it also has something to do with Sirius. As most things ultimately do. The way he pulls his hair back into a ponytail, which makes his cut glass cheekbones seem even sharper. And the way the strands end up falling loose and curling back into his face by the time they finish. How bright his eyes get as he plays, the thrill of the game glinting in the smoke grey of them. Perhaps the best part of it all being the way he smiles, with all thirty-two of his teeth at the end of a game, exertion colouring his cheeks and bringing life to his broad chest. When they're in the air together, Remus savours every moment. He loves the thrill of playing on opposing teams, of having Sirius sidle up to him on his broom as they both close in on the snitch filthy insults and distractions spilling from his lips as he tries to knock Remus off his game. But it's when he starts throwing elbows and knocking his shoulder into Remus's and just touching him that really does the trick. 
Those touches, small as they are, and even in the context of a Quidditch match, make something zing through Remus and scramble his brain enough that Sirius ends up coming out victorious. He'll tell Remus, Maybe next time, Rooney. With a dazzling grin and a clap to his shoulder, and Remus will just shrug helplessly at the disappointed frown from whichever poor sod got stuck with him as a teammate. Playing on the same team is even better. The two of them have an ease with each other that rivals the one Sirius has with Marlene. When they get possession of the quaffle and start weaving passes between James or Peter until they make it to the hoop and one of them can send it flying. Too fast to be blocked, it's something special. And every time it's Remus that ends up taking the shot and it goes soaring through the hoops, Sirius whoops excitedly pumping a fist into the air before beelining straight for him. He crashes into Remus, throwing an arm around his shoulders and shaking him, shouting about what a bloody brilliant goal it was and how Mooney's got an arm on him and the like. It's one of those post-game highs that Remus finds himself landing with after Sirius declares them the winners and they call it a day. Sirius throws his helmet off and tugs the tie from his hair, shaking it out not unlike the way Patfoot does his fur after a particularly rainy full moon night. It would be funny if it didn't make Remus's throat go dry. Some of Sirius's hair sticks to his forehead as he tips his head back, bearing the pale column of his throat, and he lets the light summer breeze fan through the rest of it. Then, he runs his own fingers through it for good measure. It's a wild mess, no matter how much taming Sirius tries to do, but somehow it still looks artful, tousled like he belongs on the cover of Witch Weekly. It's frankly unfair how good Sirius looks coming off the pitch. He has a glow about him, and his cheeks are flushed with life and excitement and the wind. Remus is pretty sure he looks ruddy and out of breath and like he's gone three rounds with his broom and lost. James and Peter land a few seconds later, breaking the spell. It's probably a good thing, too. Otherwise, Remus for sure would have been caught staring. You're a cheat, Sirius Black, James accuses, without heed. He chucks his helmet to the side and points a finger at Sirius. If you'd had counted that goal I made before you called a bloody foul, Pete and I would have won. Yeah, that was hardly a foul, Peter chimes in, shaking his head. He's the last to replace his broom in the broom cupboard, and scrambles to catch up with the other three, who have already started walking back towards the house. Sirius laughs, and swings his arm around Remus's neck. It was a foul, Prongs. You nearly knocked Remus right off his broom. It's not Quidditch unless someone nearly gets knocked off their broom. While that may be entirely true, Remus starts, and Sirius hip bumps into his as they walk. I'd much prefer to keep both hands on my stick, if you don't mind. Both hands on your stick now, eh, Mooney? James says, waggling his eyebrows at Remus. Whatever are you doing with both hands? Sirius barks out a laugh big enough that it shakes Remus's shoulders too, and Peter titters from James's other side. Hearing the innuendo for what it is, Remus rolls his eyes. Oh, come off it, you tosser, he says feeling the weight of Sirius's arm more starkly. I'm the tosser. I think that'd be you, mate, with both your hands on your stick. Then James makes a crude gesture with his hands that makes Remus blush, and Peter laughs so hard he starts to hiccup. 
Why are we talking about Mooney's stick when we should be talking about the way I stole the quaffle right from your hand, Prongs? Sirius cries, effectively steering the conversation elsewhere, much to Remus's relief. Immediately, the three of them start to pick apart the rest of the match, voices getting louder and louder as they all try to talk over one another. Remus is mostly quiet at Sirius's side, interjecting with his own comments here and there, but happy to let the rest of them carry on with the highlights. Sirius's fingertips keep brushing against Remus's shoulder where they dangle, and Remus lets himself get distracted by the touch as they approach the back door. They all tumble inside, and James leads them straight to the kitchen to scour out some snacks. In the kitchen, Euphemia Potter stands at the sink, waving her wand towards the dishes in the basin. The dish soap and scrubbing brush rise from their places, and begin cleaning one of the plates. Hello, Mum, James greets brightly. Hello, love, Miss Potter says, reaching out to ruffle James's hair as he passes by. He tries to duck out of the way, but to no use. Not that it would have made a difference. His hair already looks like he stuck his finger in the electrical socket. Sirius, Remus, Peter. Hello, dears. Mrs. Potter tacks on, smiling warmly at them. Have a good time out there, she asks. The greatest, James answers eagerly. It's going to be even better tomorrow, when Pete and I kick Remus and Sirius's asses. He grins as Sirius scoffs and shoots back in, as if. James, Miss Potter chastises his language. James gives her a sheepish look that works like a charm. It's certainly keeping you busy, she continues. I swear you've been out there more than you've been inside since you've been home. At this rate, I expect to see all of you playing for the Montreux Magpies someday. I suppose you lot would be hungry, then, Miss Potter continues, wiping her hands on her apron. She waves her wand again, and a bowl of peaches levitates into her hands. She holds it out in offering. Your father's just picked these from the tree out front. Says it's the best harvest yet. Starved, James says, plucking two peaches from the bowl. He holds one up and grins. You're a peach, Mum. Mrs. Potter laughs and rolls her eyes fondly at her son. The rest of the boys all groan at the terrible joke. Don't quit your day job, Potter. Sirius throws over his shoulder to James. Then he turns back to Mrs. Potter and the peaches and takes two as well. Thank you, Mrs. Potter. Sirius, ever the posh boy gentleman he was raised to be, says earnestly, and he kisses Mrs. Potter on the cheek. Mrs. Potter smiles and pats him on the shoulder. Sweet boy, she says. James snorts. Kiss up, he mutters under his breath, grinning at Sirius. It's called being polite, Prongs. You should try it sometimes. Sirius snarks back, smirking. For good measure, he sends a sharp elbow to James's side as he passes him, snickering as James tries to dodge it, but misses, nearly dropping the two peaches he snagged. You know you're already her favourite child, right? James teases. Sirius sticks his chin up haughtily. As I should be, he replies. Remus thanks Mrs. Potter as he takes his own peach, earning a warm touch to his cheek. The peach is soft in his hand, heavy in its ripeness, and Remus can't wait to take a bite. He raises the fruit to his lips and turns around 
eyes falling on Sirius, right as he takes a bite right into his own peach. Remus freezes, because now Sirius Black is sweaty, flushed and dripping sticky peach juice all down his chin and over his fingers. His sharp pink tongue slides past his lips to chase the juice, and Remus's insides go all squirmy. He has to look away, maybe even call Bagsy on the first shower, despite not having exerted himself nearly as hard as Sirius and James. Except he's not quick enough, and Sirius catches him staring and gives him a funny look. Is there something on my face? He asks. Before Remus can try and come up with something intelligible to say, James laughs and goes, Mate, there's more peach on your face than has made it into your big gulp. Sirius rolls his eyes and gives James a big shove with his sticky hand, which is James retaliating with his own sticky hand, and suddenly the two of them are scuffing playfully in the middle of the hallway. Remus is never been more grateful for James's need to be part of every conversation around him, and he decides to take advantage of it by slipping away for that shower. While you burks yank on each other's hair, I'm going to go clean the Quidditch off myself, he announces. Remus isn't even sure if any of them heard him over the increasingly nonsensical insults they're hurtling back and forth, but he figures he did his part and heads upstairs. In the bathroom, Remus turns the shower dial and lets the water start to heat up. He stands in front of the sink, placing his hands flat down on either side of the basin, and looks at himself. His hair, normally falling flat across his forehead, sticks up from the helmet, and his cheeks still have a splotchy red colour to them, both from the flying and the close call downstairs. It's not a very dashing look, Remus thinks. He wonders what the others see when they look at him. Wonders what Sirius sees. He wonders if Sirius would find his dishevelledness charming, or if he'd just laugh. And if Sirius could get past that, would he even like Remus, even though he's not some Quidditch prodigy? No. Sirius says, popping up behind Remus in the mirror. It startles Remus, and he feels his face grow hot, like he was caught with his pants down, which he wasn't. It doesn't help that Sirius's mouth is still glistening from that goddamn peach. His lips look brighter, glossy with the juice, and Remus is going to be in some real trouble if he doesn't look away soon. Sirius bumps his hip into Remus's to knock him out of the way of the sink. "'All right there, Mooney?' he asks, catching his eye through the mirror. Remus hopes the fact that they were playing Quidditch, even if it has been some time since they've stopped, is enough to keep Sirius from calling him on his blush. He can always try to blame it on the sun, if it comes down to it. Sirius sticks his hands beneath the faucet, running the water through his long fingers, scrubbing them together. Remus watches as Sirius cranes his neck forward in the mirror, and then licks his lips, bringing a thumb up to smudge at the corner of them. He rinses his hands once more, then shuts the water off. In the mirror, Sirius quirks an eyebrow at Remus's lack of answer, and Remus quickly nods. All right, he tells Sirius, patting himself on the back for keeping his voice steady. Trying to crack the mirror, then? Sirius asks, eyes twinkling and mouth twitching impishly. You know, you're already rugged enough without the broody eyes, he says. If you played for Quidditch, like you should... You'd have all the girls falling at your feet, you handsome buck. You 
I'm serious, he insists, as Remus starts to laugh at the ridiculousness of that. Remus tries to ignore the squirming in his gut, but Sirius calling him handsome. It doesn't mean anything. It can't. Sirius and James call each other handsome all the time, and they never mean anything by it. It can't be any different here. I'll leave them to you and James, Remus replies, rubbing his shoulder. The mirth on Sirius's face melts into something more thoughtful, and he turns to face Remus. His hand comes up to Remus's shoulder, fingers bumping into Remus's as Remus drops his hand back to his side. You were really spectacular out there today, you know? He tells him. Ernest. Remus ducks his head a little. So were you, he says, meeting Remus's eyes again. You always bloody are, great big tosser. Sirius laughs, that beautiful melodic laugh of his. He squeezes Remus's shoulder, and his thumb brushes back and forth against the hinge of Remus's neck. So very lightly, he would have missed it if his body weren't so attuned to every place Sirius touches him. He isn't sure if Sirius even realises he's doing it. It's as if time suspends itself for a few fleeting seconds in that bathroom, and Remus feels a little like he's floating, only grounded by the weight of Sirius's hand and his eyes and his kind smile. And then the bubble breaks, as Sirius wrinkles up his nose and uses his grip on Remus's shoulder to push him towards the running shower. Now go take that bloody shower. You smell, he teases. Remus laughs and calls after Sirius. Better than you do. In the shower, no matter how much he tries, he can't scrub the dopey smile off his face. Two. In the common room, Remus is pressed into sofa cushions, his back against the armrest, knees bent in front of him and supporting the spine of the muggle book he has in hand. He's hardly paying it any attention, though. Probably couldn't even tell you its name. Sirius is on the floor in front of the fireplace, with a half-played board of wizard's chest between him and Peter, who is staring at said board so intently his forehead's grown all wrinkled. Remus watches out of the corner of his eye as Sirius deftly tucks his hair behind an ear, then folds his long fingers together in front of him as he ponders his next move. He's sitting cross-legged, and his spine is curved into a perfect arc, hands tucked up under his chin. His eyes dart across the board, no doubt playing through each potential outcome to ensure he chooses the best one. Finally, Sirius leans forward and says, Night to E5. The pawn comes to life, sliding forward before the knight rises from its crouch and swings its sword, knocking Peter's pawn to bits, particularly brutally. Peter squawks in indignation, the opposite to Sirius's pleased, gloating exclamation. Nice one, Pads, Remus says from his perch, in the overstuffed armchair behind Peter. Much to everyone's surprise, he's trying to get a head start on the 12-inch transfiguration essay Professor McGonagall assigned. A rare feat for James Potter, who never lifts a quill for homework until he's at the breakfast table the morning it's due. Granted, he's only doing it now because this weekend is a Hogsmeade weekend, and he plans to ask Lily again. He thinks this might finally be his time, though he says that every time, to no avail. James keeps getting distracted from his essay, though, 
too eager to commentate the chess match. Before Sirius can gloat some more, the portrait door goes swinging open, and in bounds Lily Evans, clutching a brown paper bag carefully between her two hands. She's got a sunny smile on her face, the kind that's soft around the edges and wistful in the middle. The kind she gets when she's heard from her family, Remus notes. Her good mood effuses from her every pore, so it seems. Marlene and Mary are close on her heels, chattering away about something. Oi, Evans! James calls, sitting up straighter and pushing his glasses up his face with a finger. The wet ink tip of his quill misses his cheek by a hair. What's in the bag? Anything good? Lily purses her lips at him, but it seems that not even nosy, over-eager James Potter and his waggling eyebrows are enough to tarnish her cheery disposition. Gift from my mum, she responds airily, and instead of leaving it at that, instead of calling James a nosy prat and flouncing off to the girls' dormitories to do whatever it is that girls do up there, Lily strides forward and plants herself on the other end of Remus's sofa. She sets the bag gingerly in her lap and starts to unroll the top. It's strawberries, she tells them. The little stand up the road from our house opened back up for the season, and Mum knows how much I love them, so she sent me some. <laughs> Loads, actually. Lily giggles. I likely won't be able to finish them all myself before they start to go bad. The last of the roll comes undone, and Lily spreads the bag open. She reaches in, and one by one, removes three large plastic clamshells, of the biggest, ripest strawberries Remus, and, judging from the reactions, everyone else has ever seen. They're huge. Really, great big and bright, and so very red. Remus can practically taste them already, just looking at them. My god, Lily, he comments. Lowering his book. They're monstrous, James cries, straining forward in his chair. Biggest bloody strawberries I've ever seen, Sirius chimes in. Wizard's chess game quickly forgotten as he clambers to his knees and walks his way over to Lily on them. Did you get those from a giant? Peter asks, causing Mary to laugh. That's what I said, she titters. Lily cracks one of the clamshells open. I told the girls I'd share with them. She holds the strawberries out for Marlene and Mary to take. I suppose I'd be willing to share them with you lot, too, Lily says, glancing between the boys. If you'd like. Of course we'd like, James rushes out, jumping to his feet. He strides over to Lily in three steps and takes his pick of berries. Thanks, he tells her, smiling sweetly. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Evans, Sirius says, piling a few into his palm. <laughs> nice of you to share with James, that toss pot, he adds, snickering as James swats his hand out at him in retaliation. Yes, well, got to keep him quiet somehow, haven't we? Lily responds impishly. Sirius laughs, big and boisterous. Too true, Evans, he agrees, chuckling as he returns to his place by the fire. Strawberries balanced in hand, Sirius stretches back out across the floor. He lies on his back, setting the berries against the concave of his stomach, not caring that they will most certainly stain his pristine white shirt. And, well... It's obscene, is what it is. The way Sirius is sprawled on the floor like that, with his limbs arranged in the perfect picture of casual elegance, effortless beauty, a true show of aristocracy. Then he leans up on an elbow, with one knee propped up, and dangles a strawberry above his head. He tilts his head back, hair cascading over his shoulders loosely, and his lips are parted, pink tongue peeking out white teeth glittering. The sound of plastic rustling close by tears Remus out of his trance, and his eyes snap away from Sirius 
and to the strawberries, Lily is shaking in front of him. Remus feels himself go pink, and he slouches down behind his book. Lily doesn't say anything about the staring, but she has this knowing look on her face that might be worse. Good book, then, she asks, amusement in her tone. At least she has tact enough to try and be subtle with her teasing. Oh, um, yeah, Remus responds, perhaps too quickly, and ducks his head. Lily hums an acknowledgement. What's it about? She asks, knowing full well that Remus hasn't the foggiest. Remus's eyes drop to the pages in front of him, then back to Lily, and he opens his mouth to answer. Except, he doesn't know what to say. He hasn't the foggiest. Just because he's been turning the pages doesn't mean he's been taking a single word on them in. Lily lets him flounder for a minute before giggling into her palm, and leaning close to whisper. He does make quite the picture like that, doesn't he? And her line of sight flickers towards Sirius, before meeting Remus's once more. Sparkling. Remus debates the merits of denying, of telling Lily he has no idea what she's talking about. But there wouldn't be a point to that, really. He's good at lying when he wants to be, but he doesn't think he'd be very convincing with this one. And besides, Lily's already caught him in the act, so to say. She's far too clever and stubborn for him to convince her otherwise. And if there's one person Remus could trust with this particular secret, it would be Lily Evans. Lily quirks an eyebrow, and Remus slumps further, sighing heavily. It's answer enough. Don't let James hear you say that, he mumbles. And Lily laughs softly. She looks like she wants to say something else about Sirius, and Remus doesn't know if he can handle that. Talking about it. Gossiping. Certainly not here, anyways. So before Lily can pry any further, Remus takes a strawberry and hastily bites the whole thing off the stem. Try getting anything out of him now with a mouthful. Like hell will he incriminate himself any further. Lily, bless her, takes the hint. She rests her hand gently on his knee, giving it a small squeeze and a kind smile, before turning to join in on Mary and Marlene's riveting debate about whether Benji Fenwick actually saw the grim in his teacup in divination the day before or not. The strawberries are a hit, and they continue to get passed around their little group until most of them are eaten. Remus tries to go back to his book, but it's even harder to focus on it than before. He keeps stealing glances at Sirius, watching him lazily eat his strawberries and lick his fingers and lips clean of the juice. Sirius, thankfully, is too busy pitching in his two cents to the conversation going on around him to notice. The next time Remus looks up, James has flopped down beside Sirius, clutching his belly. He throws an arm over his forehead and groans about having eaten too much. If I didn't feel the same, I'd say maybe Evans had finally had enough and tried to poison you. Sirius laughs, nudging James's arm with his elbow. <laughs> Bloody well good enough at potions to pull it off. She's head girl, too. Marlene chimes in. No one would suspect her. Wouldn't they? Remus asks, lowering his book. James's obsession with her isn't exactly a secret. Oi, Mooney! James snaps. It's not an obsession. Sirius snorts, and James kicks a foot out, connecting with Sirius's hips. The girls giggle into their hands. I'd wager the whole school knows about it, Peter adds, 
Even the professors. Even Dumbledore, Rima says, grinning. Y yeah, but McGonagall loves Lily, Mary points out. And she probably thinks James is a numpty, the amount of attention she's given him. She'd totally let Lily get away with it. James gives another disgruntled objection that no one acknowledges. Oh, please, Lily cries. But she's giggling. I wouldn't poison him, she says. And James perks up, sending Lily his sweetest smile. But then Lily pops his balloon of hope. I wouldn't do something so obvious. It's got to look like an accident. Evans! James sits up sharply, but immediately groans and wraps his arm around his middle. Looks like I won't have to do anything, though. His eyes being bigger than his stomach will take care of it for me, Lily says, fixing James with a stern look. Potter, I told you not to eat those last three strawberries. I had to. They were so good. Here, if they're so good, why don't you have another? Sirius suggests. His stash of strawberries has dwindled down to just one, and he holds it precariously by the stem between two fingers and dangles it above James's head. James sticks up a hand to block the strawberry from sight and squeezes his eyes shut. Not a chance, Black, he says, shoving at Sirius's arm. Eat it yourself. <laughs> no way. I can't. I'm too full. Sirius laments. Oh, I don't want it. Give it to someone else. You're closest. Sirius whines. Remus rolls his eyes into the pages of his book. When Sirius and James get into a back and forth like this, there's no knowing when they'll stop. They could go on for ages. They have gone on for ages. But this one doesn't end up lasting that long. James rejects the strawberry one more time before Sirius sets his sights on a new target. Mooney. Sirius draws from his position draped across the floor. Remus swallows down a laugh and pretends like he wasn't just tracing the line of Sirius's arm and the bend of his legs with his eyes. Sirius waits until he has Remus's attention, or until Remus makes a show of giving Sirius the attention he already has. I have my last strawberry, Sirius says, extending his arm out to Remus. That doesn't do much since he's still by the fire, and Remus is still all the way on the sofa, but it's the thought that counts, Remus supposes. I'm all right, Padfoot, Remus responds. He turns the page of his book. Sirius pouts and sits up. Come on, Mooney, you've got to take it. I can't eat another, and I won't let it go to waste. I'll take it if he doesn't want it, Peter interjects. I won't let it go to waste, Sirius repeats, ignoring Peter. You've barely had any anyways. What's poor Evans gonna think? You're rejecting her generous gift like that. It'll give her a complex, and James will have your bollocks for it. Lily scoffs at that, but doesn't dignify it with a proper response. If you want him to take it from you so bad, why don't you bring it to him, Black? She suggests. Don't make him get up. He's enjoying that book too much, she adds. A cheeky twinkle in the glance she shoots Remus. R really, I'm okay, Remus says. I've had three, and they're quite sweet. You like sweet, Sirius retorts. Yes, in moderation. Nonsense, Sirius says, clambering up onto his feet. You'll eat the strawberry. I'll bring it to you, just like Evan said to. I'll even feed it to you. You won't have to lift a finger away from that precious book. Remus tries not to let his eyes bug out of his head at the offer. He really doesn't need Sirius to do that. He really doesn't know if he'd be able to handle Sirius doing that. I'm perfectly capable of feeding myself, you know, he says. 
His voice comes out a little tight, a little strained, but Sirius is too busy navigating his way to Remus, walking on his knees once more to notice. Of course you can, Sirius responds, but he doesn't look as if he has any plans of giving up. Once he's got an idea in his head, it isn't easy to persuade him out of it. The strawberry is still held in his outstretched hand, and when he shuffles close enough, Remus reaches out to grab it from him. Give it here, then, he says. Sirius jerks his hand back and tuts. No, no, I said I'd feed it to you. I'm not one to break a promise. You didn't make a promise, Remus points out. Hush, Mooney, just let me do this for you. You've had a rough week. Let me do something nice for you. Sirius stops at the edge of the sofa, right next to Remus, and presses in close. He props his elbow against Remus's knee, and smiles oh so sweetly at Remus, holding the strawberry up. He tilts his head and flutters his eyelashes, like that has anything to do with making his offer sweeter. Tam Sirius Black, and the way he has Remus wrapped around his finger. Remus has never been good at telling him no. Fine, Remus sighs, resolve crumbling quicker than a stale cookie. Tossa. Now, now, is that any way to speak to the man so graciously about to feed you? Remus asks, pausing with the strawberry halfway to Remus's mouth. I'll bite you. Don't think I won't. I'll bite back, Remus counters, showing Remus his teeth. Remus lowers his book. Have at it, then, he says, even though he's quite sure he's not ready for this. The grey of Sirius's irises is bright, glinting with pleasure at having gotten his way. He doesn't take his eyes off Remus as he brings the strawberry to Remus's lips, resting the end against them. Remus opens his mouth, lets Sirius guide the strawberry between his lips, and carefully bites down. He holds Remus's gaze. Sweetness bursts across Remus's tongue, and it's delicious. Not a single trace of that bitterness of an unripened strawberry. Remus moves the strawberry back, so Remus can chew, and his eyes flit to Remus's mouth. They linger there, one second, two seconds, and that perhaps is even more delicious than the berry. But just as quickly, they snap back up. Remus's heart stutters in his chest, and thuds so loud against his ribcage he wonders if Sirius can hear it. Sirius waits until Remus finishes chewing, and swallows his bite before bringing the strawberry back to his lips. This time, when Remus bites in, his teeth graze the tips of Sirius's fingers, and Sirius's nail catches against his bottom lip as he pulls the stem back. Remus swears something flickers in Sirius's eyes. But then again, the fire is going. It very well could have been a trick of the light. It's the most intense eye contact Remus has probably ever held in his life, and he kind of wants to drown in it. Sirius's stare is heavy, but not uncomfortable. It makes Remus feel warm and a little bit tingly like his veins are a current, his nervous system a thrumming live wire. Good? Sirius asks, Soto voice. Remus nods, swallowing the strawberry. He licks his lips, chasing that last bit of sweetness. Sirius tracks the movement. Delicious, Remus answers. Glad you said yes. 
I am. The air is thick between them, with an unspoken sort of tension that Remus is so overly aware of, that Sirius must be aware of too, but neither one of them makes to do anything about it. Perhaps if they were alone, Remus would have summoned up some of that Gryffindor courage. Mary shrieks with laughter from somewhere to their right, shattering that tension and making Remus nearly jump out of his skin. He feels like he's been caught doing something he shouldn't, which isn't even true, but when he chances a glance towards the rest of their friends, none of them are paying him and Sirius any mind. They're seated in a loose interpretation of a circle, passing the last clamshell of strawberries around as they play a game of exploding snap. Sirius whips around towards the sound so quick, his hair is a blur. What the bloody hell is so funny? He snaps, arms falling away from Remus's knee. Strawberry, quickly forgotten. He jumps to his feet, striding towards the group. And that's that. As much as Remus mourns the loss of Sirius's warm body so close to his, and his unwavering stare, he can't help the relief he feels at not having that undivided attention directed exclusively towards him anymore. Merlin knows he could use a few minutes to collect himself after that. He's glad everyone is too preoccupied with the racist game. Remus sinks back into the armrest, closing his eyes and brushing a hand through his hair and down his face. When he blinks the common room back into focus, he finds Lily's eyes trained on him. That knowing glint is back in them, and her lips quirk at the corners in amusement. Remus valiantly fights the flush threatening to rise back to his cheeks, but loses. Not now, Lily, he mumbles, before Lily can say anything about what she just witnessed. Lily holds her hands up. I wasn't going to say a thing, she replies. Remus isn't convinced. N not now, anyways, she adds, all but confirming his suspicions. Don't think you're getting out of talking about this, Remus Lupin. Remus groans, but secretly, he does think it'd be nice to talk with Lily about this. He's kept his feelings bottled up all these years, having no outlet for them. His usual confidants were out of the question. Serious because of obvious reasons, James because he's far too close to it all, and Peter because, well, he's never really been someone Remus goes to with secrets, and he didn't think this one would be the right one to start with. But Lily, she's kind and understanding, and she might be able to help him figure out what to do about it. Right now, though, Remus thinks some time alone might do his mind well to settle down. It'll probably be easier to stop thinking about Sirius if he isn't in the same room as him. Decided, Remus closes his book with a snap. It's loud enough that a few of his friends look up from their game, and he sends them a sheepish look. He didn't mean to interrupt. Finished already? Peter asks gesturing towards his book. So quick with books, Marlene exclaims. I wish I could read like that. It'd sure help with all the studying I've got to do. Remus shakes his head. No, not finished. Just done reading for the moment, he says. Sirius perks up. Does that mean you're joining the game, then? He asks. He looks excited at the prospect, whether it's because he genuinely wants Remus to play, or because he knows he can beat Remus easily. Afraid not, Remus answers, pressing his lips into an apologetic line. I'm feeling rather sleepy, so if you don't mind, I'm going to head up for a bit of a kip. Sirius frowns. 
You're sure you don't want to play just one round? I'm sure. Tell me about it later, though, Rima says. I want to know who wins. All right, Sirius agrees, resigned. It's obvious he's trying not to look too disappointed, but Remus knows him too well not to see it. He can feel that magnetic pull Sirius has on him starting to tug, already breaking down his decision to leave. Remus looks away first, so as not to let it win. He tucks his book under his arm and heads towards the staircase. Have a nice nap, Mooney. Sirius calls after him. Remus pauses at the foot of the stairs, turning back to Sirius. Thanks, Padfoot. Went around for me, he says, grinning. Sirius brightens and nods. Absolutely. Remus turns quickly back towards the stairs to hide the silly smile that tugs at his lips. A talk with Lily might be better sooner rather than later, he thinks, stealing one last glance from the top of the stairs. It's getting too difficult to stuff all these feelings down. Remus isn't sure how much longer he'll be able to keep it up before something drastic happens. Part 3 It's springtime at Hogwarts, and that means there's a renewed vigour in the air. The weather is warming, the snow is melting, and the flowers are blooming. The promise of summer looms on the horizon now, and with that, the end of classes and curfews and detentions. But springtime also means that exams are upon Hogwarts. That last hurdle to jump before that sweet freedom is theirs. Remus doesn't quite see it like that, though. He loves Hogwarts. Classes, curfews, detentions and all. And he doesn't mind the exams so much, either. He likes studying, likes absorbing new information, and seeing the payoff when he can remember it easily and apply what he's learnt in practical ways. He also likes passing along what he's learned to other students seeing the light bulb go off when they make a connection he's helped lead them to, or their excitement when they recall a clever trick he's taught them to remember something difficult. It comes as no surprise that the library is one of Remus's favourite spots at Hogwarts. But since it's exam time, the place is crawling with students taking up every open table, and most of the nooks and crannies Remus likes to tuck himself away into. Not to mention, in the library... Students from his study group seem to think they can approach him at all times to ask him questions, or ask him for tips and tricks he might have, as if he doesn't need some time to study himself. He likes helping them. He does. But he can't very well do so if he doesn't have it down pat first. Which is why Remus chose to brave the great outdoors to get some studying done. Along with Remus, those that don't care to study, or don't need to, are outside, taking advantage of the nice weather. There are a few groups of students scattered across the lawns, chattering and laughing and snacking. A row of Ravenclaw girls sitting on the stone walls, braiding each other's hair. A couple of Hufflepuffs playing Muggle Frisbee on the other side of the Great Lake. It's a lovely day out, not too cold anymore, and not yet too hot. The sun peeks out from behind the big puffy clouds, the birds are chirping as they flit through the sky, and there's a nice breeze that ruffles the grass and the ends of Remus's hair. The pair of them are sitting in the shade of a tree, near the edge of the Great Lake, one of Remus's tartan blankets spread over the grass beneath them. There's a few textbooks spread between them, most of which belong to Remus, along with a few wells of ink, rolls of parchment, and a couple of spare quills. Remus has his history of magic textbook open, 
his arithmetic textbook being used as a support, beneath the piece of parchment he has propped up against his knees, so his already difficult-to-read handwriting doesn't come out shakier. Remus flips the pages and scratches out another sentence. He's gotten maybe three of the required twelve inches done, and what would normally be such an easy assignment has proven so much harder thanks to his study partner. Sirius sits cross-legged, a scant foot away from Remus, practicing his transfiguration. He keeps pointing his wand at a plum, turning it into a teacup and back again, over and over. The flick of his wrist is distracting, the quiet murmur of the spell just sultry enough that Remus has reread the same paragraph four times over now. Remus isn't sure why Sirius wanted to join him for a study session in the first place. Studying isn't something Sirius Black chooses to do. He'd much rather plant dung bombs in the dungeons, or sneak as much pudding from the kitchens as he can carry, or faff about in the common room. He's the kind of smart that he doesn't even need to study. He can bugger off his homework and barely lift a pinky in class and still make top marks and everything. James is like that too. The perks of being a pureblood, Remus supposes. He has to work twice as hard as everyone else for the same results. Then again, maybe it's just a Sirius and Remus thing. Peter is a pureblood, and he has to work even harder than Remus, and he still only consistently falls somewhere in the middle. Remus has a feeling Sirius only joined him because James is on his head boy rounds, and Peter has a gobstones club meeting, and Sirius never likes being left alone. Nonetheless, Sirius had voluntarily joined Remus, despite Remus making it very clear that he intended to study, to crack his books and work on his essays and practice for the upcoming exams. There was to be no funny business. Sirius had simply nodded, and promised to be perfectly respectful to Remus's study time. Except, he hasn't been perfectly respectful, that is. He's been nothing but a bloody distraction the whole time. First, it was Sirius absent-mindedly twirling his wand between his long, slender fingers. Remus had glanced up from his essay to ask Sirius if Professor Binns wanted twelve, or thirteen inches of parchment, and instead found his mind quickly filling with fantasy after fantasy of the various other things those fingers surely could do. Then, Sirius had abandoned his wand for his quill, to fill in a star chart for divination. He had a bad habit of pressing the tip of his quill to the plush of his lower lip when he was deep in thought, and it was no different this time. Remus suspects he bullshitted the entire chart, considering it had taken Sirius less than ten minutes to finish it, but if he didn't look the picture of prophetic, as he poised his quill to his mouth and pondered his answers. Then, Sirius abandoned all theoretical studying for the practical, picking his wand back up and going through the motions of various charms and spells that they'd been tested on. The tip of his tongue had poked out of his mouth, an adorable wrinkle forming between his eyebrows as he worked on perfecting the swish of his wand and the flick of his wrist. In a cruel flip of the script, it seemed that, for once in his life, Sirius was getting more studying done than Remus. And now, a bloody plum. Sirius transfigures the plum twice more, before growing bored and levitating it in the air. He floats it back and forth, makes it do a loop-de-loop -loop through the air, then holds his hand out and whisks it gently into his palm. His hands close around the fruit, and he sets his wand down to grab one of the books. It's Remus's Care of Magical Creatures textbook, a class Sirius is not in, but he flips it open to a random page and starts to read anyway. The plum sits in his hand. His fingers flex around it, then he starts to roll it between them, practically fondling the thing. Remus grips his quill so tight that he's afraid he'll snap it and Sirius is blissfully unaware of his effect. His fingers are still up against the plum, 
Then, and Remus thinks he's been given a reprieve. Until Sirius brings the fruit up to his mouth and takes a bite. And it's sharp canines, piercing the firm, dark flesh, sinking into something soft and sweet, tangy and delicious. In a desperate bid, Remus wishes it was him Sirius was sinking his teeth into. His neck, his lip, maybe a shoulder. He isn't picky, really, and the thought makes him blush darker than that plum. Sirius's mouth comes away from the plum, shining, lips stained a shade darker. The lower one sits heavy with it, oh so inviting, and Remus has never wanted to taste so bad. He pulls his gaze away from Sirius's mouth. Nothing good will come of continued staring, eyes instead landing on the plum. Specifically, the way Sirius's hand curls around it. All long fingers and sharp knuckles and clean, neat nails. Remus's eye catches on a trickle of plum juice dripping down the side of a finger, watches its slow descent and the way it settles in the webbing between. He wants to lick it clean. He doesn't know what comes over him then. Or maybe he does. Either way, his body moves before his brain realizes what he's doing. And Remus leans across the way, stretching his arm out, and knocks the fruit clean out of Sirius's hand. It hits the ground with a soft thud, wobbling against the edge of the blanket, then slowly succumbing to the pull of gravity, and tumbling down the gentle slope of the hill right towards the edge of the lake. Sirius's eyes follow it for all of a second, before snapping back to Remus's face, indignation written in the frown of his lips and the pinch of his brows. A pendulous second passes. Two. Three. They both blink at each other, eyes owlish, dumbfounded. Sirius breaks the silence. Remus, he starts. What the bloody hell was- Remus kisses him. Sirius stills in surprise, and time stretches to just the wrong side of too long that an icy gush of panic slices through Remus's veins. He sits back right away, hastily wiping the back of his wrist across his mouth as if that were enough to erase his massive misjudgment of their memories. Out of sight, out of mind, right? Remus's eyes drop to the blanket between them, catching on the small wet patch where the plum first landed, before rolling away. Remus would quite like to roll away too, as it were. Sirius hasn't uttered a word, and his silence is unnerving. The boy who has a comment for everything suddenly has nothing to say. Remus feels like he might throw up. His heart pounds deafeningly in his ears, as his brain, sounding horrifyingly like the vicious voice of a wild burger black howler, shrieks at him that he's really gone and done it now. He's crossed the line. He's gone too far. He's lost control at precisely the moment he should have held the reins the tightest. Remus chances a glance up at Sirius, and he hasn't moved an inch either. His face is delicately blank, and Remus can't tell if any second now Sirius will haul off and punch him, laugh it off, or give him a humiliating, pitying look and try to let him down easy. Remus doesn't let himself hope that Sirius will ask him to do it again. He's not that much of a masochist. It's quite off-putting, not being able to read Sirius. Remus is usually so good at it, so well attuned to his moods and expressions and body language. Sirius the storm and Remus the weather vane. 
It's frightening to not know what he's thinking. To not even have an inkling. Will you... You bloody say something. Remus eventually croaks. Sirius's eyes flicker up, finally to meet Remus. The corner of his mouth twitches, and then... And then a fully-fledged smile blooms across his face. It isn't one that Remus has seen before, either. Nothing that comes up in his expensive catalogue of serious black smiles, which makes his stomach flop. No. This one is new, and it's brighter around the eyes and bigger around the teeth. It's like the sun is trying to burst through every crack and crevice. Remus doesn't dare let himself hope yet, but it's a close thing, teetering on the edge, racing his heart. It's just serious darts, pauses, laughs. I think you've made me speechless. It isn't what Remus is expecting to hear. His eyebrows bounce up. I... What? Sirius nods. Have I really? Remus asks, still jittery with nerves. He doesn't know if rendering Sirius speechless is a good thing or a bad one. Sirius is smiling, sure, but... He also smiles oh so sweetly before dropping a blistering string of curses and some nasty hexes to boot on Snape. Remus doesn't think he falls into that same camp, but one can never be too sure with this kind of thing. Yeah. You've gone and stolen my whole vocabulary with your lips. Serious jokes. Was that your plan all along? A laugh bubbles up, and... Remus feels a little delirious from the relief that floods through him. You've found me out, he plays along. I just desperately wanted to sound exactly like a pompous, aristocratic, pure-blood ponce, and that was the only way to achieve it, he lays on. It has nothing to do with the great big mountains of feelings I've had for you since puberty. The sharp intake of breath across from him has Remus turning pink as his words catch up to his ears. Oh, he says, embarrassed by how easily that tumbled right out. He hadn't meant for it to. Oh, Sirius repeats after. There's a breathless sort of edge as he asks, Have you, has it really been that long? Remus's brain scrambles, trying to think of a way to backtrack or damage control enough that it doesn't sound as pathetic as it is, him furtively pining away all these years like that. But there's wonder in Sirius's eyes, in his face, a pleased sort of awe that makes Sirius want to be honest. It has, he tells Sirius. Maybe even... Maybe even longer. But but that's when I really figured it out. In fourth year. Fourth year. Sirius repeats marvelled. But just as quickly, a storm crosses over his face. And he picks up his roll of unused parchment and thumps Remus on the head with it. Oi! What was that for? You git! You great big buck! You complete tosspot! Sirius cries. Why are you calling me names now? Remus shouts, holding his hands up so Sirius doesn't thwack him again. He thought things had been going all right, but his accidental confession was being taken with grace and respect. The way Sirius was responding, he'd even gone so far as to start letting himself hope. This turn of events just leaves him more confused than ever. Sirius releases the parchment and stares at Remus, 
wild-eyed. You're telling me we could have been doing that for years? Until Sirius drops that on him. What? Remus rasps. It feels as though he's been sucker-punched in the solar plexus, like all the air has been washed out of his lungs and caved into his chest cavity to boot. Sirius flicks him in the nose, looking quite fond for someone who's just committed two acts of violence against Remus. I'm bloody in love with you, too. Oh. Remus goes a little cross-eyed with it, and his heart swells so big in his chest that it's ever harder to breathe. There's a lot Remus could say to that. He could tell Sirius how he's been waiting to hear that for ages, that he's been hoping and wishing and dreaming of it, that he never thought he would hear it, and now that he has, he never wants it to stop. He could ask how long it's been for Sirius, or why he didn't say anything. He could call him beautiful, tell Sirius he's the brightest star. He could say something proper romantic about how Sirius is his person, always has been, and Remus has a sneaking suspicion, always will be. But the only thing he can think of is kissing Sirius again. Properly, this time. So he tells him that. I'd like to kiss you again, if that's all right. Oh, now you ask. But Sirius is already on his knees, shuffling closer. He touches Remus's shoulder, and their noses bump together. Shut up, Remus mumbles into Sirius's mouth. Remus kisses the pucker of Sirius's lips, and Sirius responds in kind, opening his mouth just enough that their lips slide into place against one another. It's so much better this way, and suddenly Remus can taste him, the sweet of Sirius, the tart of the fruit. And then Sirius's plum-honeyed tongue curls into Remus's mouth, licking his teeth, his tongue. Remus matches him, embarking on his own expedition, mapping the ridges of Sirius's soft palate, the silky inner skin of his lower lip. Sirius tastes like plums, rich and seductive, saccharine sweet with an acidic spark and an astringent bite. You taste like plums, Remus tells him. Sirius laughs. Are you calling me a tart? Remus shoves him in the shoulder, rolling his eyes. Sirius doesn't go very far, though. Hands curled around Remus's elbows, keeping him close. I was eating one before this. In case you don't remember walloping the thing straight out of my hand like a madman, Sirius teases. Where'd it go, anyway? He peers over Remus's shoulder. Remus twists in place to look towards the lake, too. He doesn't see the plum anywhere. Squid's probably got it by now. Sirius shrugs and starts to pull Remus back in. Guess I'll have to find something else to occupy my mouth with. And he kisses him for the third time. Sirius's hand twists into the front of Remus's shirt, leaving stained fingerprints in the folds of the fabric. Remus couldn't care less. Sirius's palms drew up Remus's neck then, to clutch at his face, adding plummy strokes to the well-worn canvas, and Remus's fingers curl around the bird bones of his wrist, holding him in place. The fingers of his other hand wind through Sirius's long, dark tresses and settle against the base of his skull. Sirius tilts his head, changing the angle just so, and deepening the kiss, and this. Remus finally gets what all the fuss is about. 
the way James and Sirius and even Peter would go on and on about how kissing was just the best, and how they could do it for ages and never get tired of it. Remus used to tease them, and say that they only felt that way because no girl would let them do anything but kiss them, but now... Now he gets it. And it wasn't like Remus himself didn't like kissing before. He did, thought it was pleasant enough the few times he'd done it, but... It had never felt like this. So toe-curlingly good. Remus knows that that is entirely because of Sirius. Brilliant, wonderful, beautiful Sirius. It's just so lovely, sharing space, sharing breath, sharing spin, with Sirius. And he's so good at it, too. So attentive with his lips and his tongue, taking his time with it, changing up the angle and the pressure to keep it exciting. It sends sparks right down to Remus's toes, and leaves him feeling floaty and spellbound. The palm against Remus's cheek slides down to cup his jaw, and Sirius's thumb skims across Remus's chin. It settles against the tail end of the scar that stretches from the peak of Remus's left cheekbone to just beneath the right corner of his mouth. Sirius brushes the pad of his finger down the line of it. Once. Twice. And then replaces the thumb with his lips. He kisses the corner of Remus's mouth, then the scar below, then the hinge of Remus's jaw before slowly leaning back. Remus lets out a shuddering breath, eyes fluttering against the tops of his cheeks. It's overwhelming to have Sirius's attention on him like that, to have him touch so gently. So lovingly. When his eyes finally flicker back open, Sirius is watching him with the softest expression. He sweeps his thumb over Remus's cheek once more, touches the scar again, gently, sweetly, and then presses the tip of his finger against the plush of Remus's bottom lip, right where he'd been kissing only moments ago. I've been wanting to do that for ages, Sirius says. Remus's heart, already full to burst, skips a beat. You already know I have too, he replies. It feels so good to admit that again, to be free with his affections now. He doesn't have to bury them deep or try to pass them off as something friendlier. Now, he can tell Sirius exactly as it is, whenever he'd like. And the best part is, Sirius feels the same. Sirius considers Remus for a moment. What made you finally do it, then? He questions. Almost four years of keeping it all bottled up like you do, and you suddenly break now? You're usually so good at brooding over your secrets without needing to share them. More gifts. Remus scoffs and rolls his eyes. If anyone broods over anything, it'd be you, he shoots back. Sirius doesn't deny it. Even shrugs a little like he knows Remus is right. Don't change the subject he says. Come on, you must have a good reason. And, oh, does Remus wish he had a good reason? He wishes it was something profound or romantic, like how his love for Sirius was just too strong and he couldn't go on without finally putting it out there for his sake or Sirius's sake to find out once and for all if Sirius felt the same. If only. Remus subconsciously makes a face at the thought. Isn't it enough that I did finally tell you? He asks. Why'd you need to know the exact reason? 
Remus, we could have kept on this keeping secrets bollocks for years if you hadn't, Sirius exclaims. I know I had no intention of bringing it up any time soon, he admits, pressing his lips together ruefully. It's not like I did either, Remus says. It just kind of happened. I gathered that from the look on your face after you did it, Sirius muses. But what made you do it if you weren't planning to? Do you really want to know? I really do. Remus sighs deeply, feeling utterly ridiculous as he opens his mouth. It was that blasted plum, he mumbles. Sirius sits up. What? Remus buries his face in his hands and groans. It was that bloody plum, he repeats. Sirius leans in. What does that even mean? Remus sighs again. You're a bloody menace when you're eating fruit. Sirius grins, shark-like. That's what does it for you then, he teases. Eating fruit. Next I'll expect you'll tell me that brushing my teeth three times a day and having a good gut health really revs your engine too. And while that maybe actually isn't entirely wrong, a healthy living, breathing, all-in-one-piece Sirius is always a good one, and hygiene is sexy, Remus doesn't dare give Sirius that kind of cannon fodder. It's not the bloody fruit that does it. It's the way you eat it. Sirius crows with laughter, looking positively gleeful. Oh, you slack! Burying his face into Sirius's shoulder, Remus groans again. This is why I didn't want to tell you. <laughs> no, no, Mooney. That's... I'll stop laughing. I'm done laughing, I promise. Sirius insists. But he's still painted with amusement. Grinning wide. It's great, really. I'm a bit of a slag myself, he adds. When Remus doesn't look convinced. I am. Look... Your thing is fruit, and my thing is chocolate. Chocolate. Remus repeats, furrowing his brow. Sirius nods. Chocolate. Yes. I haven't been able to eat a bar of Honeyduke's finest without popping one, and it's all your fault. Remus laughs. You're having me on, he says. I'm not. Sirius replies. I mean it, completely. The way you eat those chocolate bars, Mooney. He gives him a look. I sometimes think you might like a moment alone with them. I mean it. I don't think you realize, but you make this face like... Like you're in total bliss. It looks like, well... He trails off, eyes going wide in meaning. Bloody hell, Mooney. It's, you know, it could drive a man to madness. It could. It's ridiculous. It's pure and utter ridiculousness how gone they are for each other. And Remus laughs at their obliviousness and their shared foolishness. He laughs and Sirius joins in and they're falling against each other, giggling and grinning and Remus can't help it. Marlon, I love you. Remus's laughter stutters after the words spill out, but only briefly, because it's okay. He can say that now. He can say that now. Sirius's smile grows, which Remus didn't even know was possible, since it's already so big and the breeze ruffles his hair and Sirius, brightly, 
joyously, beautifully, says, I love you too. And, oh, if those words aren't their own kind of magic, coming from Sirius. You know, Sirius says, nudging his shoulder against Remus's. says. Whatever the reason, I'm glad you did it. Rima softens, bumps his shoulder back against Sirius's. Me too, he says. They smile at each other for a moment, before Sirius stretches his legs out in front of him and leans back on his hands. He tips his head back and closes his eyes, letting the breeze float through his hair and the sun shine on his face. All that talk about plums and chocolate is maybe a bit peckish, you know, he says. The plum wasn't enough? Sirius cracks an eye open. Well, I didn't exactly get to finish it, he says pointedly. Besides, it had a funny taste. I don't think you're meant to eat something after it's been transfigured that many times. Rima snorts and glances down at his watch. It's nearing one in the afternoon, which means the Great Hall is still serving for at least another hour. Reckon we call it a day here and get some lunch then? Sirius already has his wand out, spelling their things together. The parchments roll back up, the inkwells cork themselves the blanket tugs taut as it tries to remove itself from beneath them and fold itself up. Reckon that sounds brilliant, Sirius answers. He rises to his feet then, holding a hand out for Remus. Remus takes it and lets Sirius pull him to his feet. He doesn't drop Remus's hand once he's up, instead twining their fingers together at their sides, hidden between their robes. All right? Sirius asks. All right, Remus replies, nodding firmly, and they start making their way back towards the castle. As they close in on the Great Hall, Sirius pulls a pensive face and cocks his head towards Remus. Remus, Sirius says, thoughtful. Hmm? Reckon they'll have any cherries in there? Sirius asks. Remus's brows pull together. Cherries. Yeah, cherries, Sirius says. It's just, I know how to tie knots with the stems. A wicked grin spreads across his face. With my tongue. Remus nearly trips. Thought you might be interested, you know, considering your affliction for me and fruit, Sirius adds, all casual-like, but his smirk gives him away. Remus groans. I'm never living that one down, am I? Sirius cackles gleefully. <laughs> Not any time soon, Mooney, my dear. Remus sighs, trying to sound exasperated, but really, it just comes out dreadfully fond. You'll be the death of me, Sirius Black. I swear you will. Sirius's laugh tapers into a hum, softer, sweeter, as he says, Yeah, then catches Remus's eye, but you love me anyways. Yeah, Remus says. I really do.